Hey everyone, thanks for joining me uh, as we begin our conversation of Beowulf, specifically the Seamus Haney translation. Um, and I've already made one video where I kind of gave some background information of some things. Um, and if you haven't seen that, I highly encourage you to look at that first because I'm not going to really go back and explain a lot of things. I'm going to kind of assume that you are on the same page that I am on. Um, this is not a book that has specific chapters or books the way that the Iliad of the Odyssey has. Uh, this is one continuous tale. In this particular video, I'm going to begin where it all starts on page three, and I will end up on page 41. All right, so uh, without further ado, I'm just going to go ahead and jump right on in. What we see at the very beginning is a lineage of sorts, a lineage of very noteworthy Danes. Danes are people from Denmark. Um, and we begin with the character of Shield Schiefton, or Shield Schiefson, I'm sorry, Shield, Shield Schiefson. And where uh, we are going to go, we're going to work ourselves all the way to uh, King Hrothgar, and then we're going to stop at King Hrothgar. All right. Um, and this is to, for, I guess, the, the, the time period, people knew, oh, Shield Sheefson was a very prominent person, and this is how we've gotten to this other prominent person where we're stopping, which is Hrothgar. So we start this lineage. Um, I want you to see also about line, let's say, 17 or so, 16, 17, um, where it says, uh, quite straight up, Lord of life, the glorious Almighty, a reference to the Christian God. And I've mentioned before, this book straddles uh, different theologies, relying sometimes on the Norse mythology and sometimes on the newer version that had come up at the time, Christianity. Also, you will see two lines under that, the word Baal, or the name Baal. Okay? That is not Beowulf. We're not there yet. It's just a typical uh, moniker of the time, so I don't want you to get confused. Um, going on, I find uh, on page five a very interesting line, one that I think is so incredibly important, and one that I feel that we've absolutely lost sight of in our era today. That line is, behavior that's admired is the path to power among people everywhere. And if you let that sink in, oh, if that were only true. We know that a lot of times people lie, cheat, steal, sleep their way to the top, whatever the case may be. Um, and sometimes even getting to the top, or often getting to the top, doesn't fix any of that problem. It continues and makes it worse. But in this era, oh, how nice it must have been. Behavior that's admired is the path to power among people everywhere. I just had to linger over that thought for just a minute. All right. Beginning on line 30, what we see is... Uh, when S.H.I.E.L.D. has died, we see this typical, um, or what we believe of, that, that, that uh, Viking funeral, where the person is laid to rest on a ship with all sorts of accoutrements around the person. And, a, you know, a, a, I believe it says the word a barrow, like a, um, an arch over the person as they set the person uh, to sail, and the idea was that person would go out into the water and from there cross over into the next life. All right, and I'm going to read this to you, beginning on line 30, page 5. It says, They shouldered him out to the sea's flood, the chief they revered, who had long, who had long ruled them. A ring world prow rode in the harbor, ice clad, outbound, a craft for a prince. They stretched their beloved Lord in his boat, laid out by the mast amidships, the great ring giver. Far-fetched treasures were piled upon him in precious gear. I never heard before of a ship so well furbished, with battle tackle, bladed weapons, and coats of mail. The mast treasure was loaded on top of him. It would travel far out into the ocean's sway. They decked his body no less bountifully with offerings than those first ones did, who cast him away when he was a child and launched him alone out over the waves. And they set a gold standard up high above his head and let him drift to wind and tide, bewailing him and mourning 
their loss. All right? So the standard was the word. I used barrow there, but um, the word is standard. Okay? So it's that, that, that idea. You've seen this in, in maybe in, in films where they set the, um, the person adrift for the last funeral rites. All right? So um, we, we continue on from shield, from that funeral, on through to Half Dane, you'll see Half Dane about line 55 on page 7. Half Dane held sway for as long as he lived and their elder, uh, their elder and warlord. He was four times a father, this fighter prince. One by one they enter the world. Herogar, Hrothgar, that's the important one. That's the one that we're going to focus on here in just a second. The good Halga and a daughter, I have heard, who was only as queen a bomb in bed to the battle-scarred Swede. So right here we see a couple things. The men are named. The daughter isn't, but her husband is. All right, so that's pretty telling about where uh, we see women in this regard, in this particular place. Also, she married a battle-scarred Swede. These are Danes. These are people from Denmark, and she married a Swede. So there is a relationship, obviously, between the people of Denmark and the people of Sweden. All right, And, and if you've seen the video before, they're not that far apart. Not at all. All right. But now we see this. It says, the fortunes of war favored Hrothgar. He did well in war. And because he did well in war, he's going to amass a certain fortune. All right? Skipping about three lines, it says, So his mind turned to hall building. Uh, he handed down orders for men to work on a great mead hall, meant to be the wonder of the world forever. It would be his throne room where he would dispense his God-given goods to young and old, but not the common land or people's lives. Far and wide. Uh, through the world, I have heard, orders for work to adorn that wallstead were sent to many peoples. And soon it stood there, finished and ready in full view, the Hall of Halls. Herut was the name. He had settled on it, whose utterance was law. So Hrothgar has been successful in war. And as a result, he has amassed a fortune and amassed um, you know, respect. And so he's built this hall. And it's this hall where he will preside, he will rule over, he will dispense his laws, he will lavish, uh, you know, things on the deserving people, and just where he will conduct his business. And it's also where people will gather together and drink mead and eat and revel in the job well done that, you know, they have accomplished, all right? And it is said to be a beautiful place. So, what I want you to understand before we read the next little thing is that's where people will come together and they will drink mead. That's fermented honey. That's, it's like a, it's, it's an alcoholic beverage. It's, it's like a beer, so to speak. Um, and they will sing songs and make all kinds of a ruckus. All right. So keep that in mind and read, begin reading on the page, but at the top of page nine. All right. It says, then a powerful demon, a prowler through the dark, nursed a hard grievance. It harrowed him to hear the din of the loud banquet every day in the hall, the harp being struck, and the clear song of a skilled poet telling with mastery of man's beginnings how the Almighty had made the earth a gleaming plain girded with waters. Interesting enough here. One, it's about the Almighty creating the earth. There's Christianity. But also it's the idea that the earth is a plain. This is a flat earth conspiracy uh, realm, I guess, right here. Um, and so, uh, but it says that this monster hated to hear that music and hated to hear those praises lavished on the Almighty. Okay, it's a demon. It does not like the praise that the Almighty Father is getting. All right, let's continue on. Uh, line 99. So times were plentiful for the people there until finally one, a fiend out of hell, began to work his evil in the world. Grendel was the name of this grim demon haunting the marches, marauding round the heath. All right, so we, now we know. We have Hrothgar, and Hrothgar created the Mead Hall. And then we have Grendel, this demon who does not like hearing all the noise and the ruckus 
coming from the revelry of that mead hall. Skipping a couple lines, this is interesting. Cain's clan, whom the Creator had outlawed and condemned as outcast for, for the killing of Abel, the eternal Lord had exacted a price. Cain got no good from committing that murder because Almighty made him anathema. And out of the curse of his exile, there sprang ogres and elves and evil phantoms and the giants too who strove with God. Time and again until he gave them their reward. All right. So just as soon as we have the Christianity, we have ogres and elves and giants. Okay. We can straddle these two uh, uh, belief systems here. All right. Where we have the uh, old Nordic ideas with the elves and the ogres, and then we have the almighty God, the creator, and the mention of Cain. And for those of you who don't know, um, Cain is a character from the Bible. Um, Cain was uh, in, is from the Garden of Eden story, all right? Um, one of Adam and Eve's sons. They had Cain, Abel, and then later Seth. Cain and Abel are the ones that have the um, majority of the attention there. All right, because uh, they were supposed to give um, sacrifices to Yahweh, all right, God. And um, the idea was, in most cases, to give a sacrifice, it needed to be an animal sacrifice. Well, Abel gave the animal sacrifice he was supposed to. Cain, though, Cain worked the fields and came and gave the sacrifice of what he had, which was harvest, which were crops. And it said that Yahweh found favor in um, Abel's, but not Cain's. Cain became super jealous of his brother Abel and ended up murdering his brother Abel. So according to the biblical story, the first murder ever committed was fratricide, the killing of one's own brother. And as it says here, the offspring of Cain were cursed forever. And so this is putting Grendel, the demon, that hates the songs uh, sung to God as part of Cain's clan, the cursed Cain's clan, all right? Um, and then what we find is that this Grendel, this demon out in the marshes, comes in and begins killing indiscriminately in Herod. Line 120 on page 11. Suddenly then the God-cursed brute was creating havoc. Greedy and grim, he grabbed 30 men from their resting places and rushed to his lair. Flushed up and inflamed from the raid, blundering back with the butchered corpses. All right, <clears throat> so after Grendel takes uh, these men off, they see the destruction, all right? And then we see Hrothgar, it says, uh, line 134, he was numb with grief, but got no respite. For the night, for one night later, merciless Grendel struck again with more gruesome murders, malignant by nature. He never showed remorse. It was easy then to meet with a man shifting himself to a safer distance to bed in the Bothies. For who would the who would be blind to the evidence of his eyes, the obviousness of that hall watcher's hate? Whoever escaped kept a weather eye open and moved away. So the idea is that people started clearing out. This Herod was a place where people would come together, where people would re re revel in things and where they would drink and, and sing songs. And now people are staying clear of it because, well, obviously. Okay. And it says there at the bottom, so Grendel ruled in defiance of right, one against all until the greatest house in the world stood empty. All right. No one wants to be there for the obvious reasons. It's a death trap. All right. But line 150, this is where we kind of start on this hero's journey thing. Line 150 tells us the news of this was known over the whole world. All right. So we have a call. All right. It's interesting too about, let's say, line 165, 166, where it's talking about Grendel here. And it says, He took over Herod, haunted the glittering hall after dark. But the throne itself, the treasure seat, he was kept from approaching. He was the Lord's outcast. And this time, the idea was that if someone was a ruler, that ruler was there because that was the will of God. 
And that person was chosen by God and therefore sanctified by God. And so Grendel, realizing that, having respect for that, Grendel never actually approached the throne itself. Okay, I find that interesting. There is more discussion there of the people putting out prayers and even, you know, going to their, through their pagan rites and rituals. Okay, that straddling of the theologies there. Okay. Now, we're going to change and we're going to have sight into our hero. Okay, so it shifts from, the, the focus shifts from Denmark to Sweden. All right, or Geetland, which we said before is southern Sweden. All right. Uh, this is about what, line 195 uh, on page 15. When he heard about Grendel, Hylix Thane was on home ground over in Geetland. There was no one else like him alive. In his day, he was the mightiest man on earth, high-born and powerful. He ordered a boat that would ply the waves. He announced his plan to sail the Swan's Road, that would be the ocean there, and search out that king, the famous prince who needed defenders. Nobody tried to keep him from going. I want you to remember this because we will see something kind of where we will look back on this and go, wait a minute, something isn't adding up from the beginning of the story towards the middle end of the story. It says, nobody tried to keep him from going. No elder denied him, dear as he was to them. Instead, they inspected omens and spurred his ambition to go. Whilst he moved about like the leader he was, enlisting men, the best he could find with 14 others, the warrior boarded the boat as captain, a canny pilot among the currents. All right. It kind of reminds me, in a way, of Telemachus getting his men to go out and sail. But anyway. Um, and they sail across from Geetland, southern Sweden, over to Denmark. And then it says at the bottom, uh, you know, that, the bottom of that first break on page 17, it says, they thanked God for that easy crossing on a calm sea. So before they inspected omens, and now they're thanking God. All right? See that little, that straddling there. All right? So... Whenever they get in and they find land or they, you know, come ashore, they start unloading all of their, uh, their arms, their, you know, their battle tackle, their shields, their, their you know, swords and spears and all of these things. And there is a sentry, okay, a, a guard up high who sees this boat come in and wonders, what the heck are they doing? We've never seen people just all of a sudden come out and just start laying their arms out. Are these people who are coming here with arms for a reason to do us harm or what? Now, we've read the other works and we knew about Xenia where it was all about welcoming the stranger. We can see that's not a part of how things work here. All right. Um, line 229. When the watchman on the wall, the shielding's lookout, whose job it was to guard the sea cliffs, saw shields glittering on the game plate and battle equipment being unloaded, he had to find out who and what the arrivals were. So he rode out to the shore, the horsemen of Hrothgars, and challenged them in formal terms, flourishing his spear, trying to be as loud and as imposing as he can possibly be. And so he, see, he says, you know, whoa, what are y'all doing here? And he looks specifically and sees one in particular. And he says, about three lines down on page 19, never before uh, has a force under arms disembarked so openly, not bothering to ask if the sentries allowed them safe passage or the clan had consented. Nor have I seen a mightier man at arms on this earth than the one standing here. Unless I'm mistaken, he is truly noble. There is n this is no mere hanger on in a hero's armor. So he says, I don't know what you guys are doing. I've never before seen anybody be this audacious and unload their stuff like this. But I can also see that there is one dude among you who is the real deal. All right. And Beowulf speaks and announces on line 260, We belong by birth to the Geet people and owe allegiance to Lord Hylic. In his day, my father was a famous man, a noble warrior named Ecgtheo. All right. So Beowulf is son of Ecgtheo in much the same way uh, Beowulf was son of Laertes. All right. 
He says on page 21, line 279, I can show the wise Hrothgar a way to defeat his enemy and find respite if any respite is to reach him, ever. I can calm the turmoil and terror in his mind, otherwise he must endure woes and live with grief for as long as his hall stands at the horizon on its high ground. Undaunted, sitting astride his horse, the Coast Guard answers, Anyone with gumption and a sharp mind will take the measure of two things, what's said and what's done. I believe what you have told me, that you are a troop loyal to our king. All right. So he's going to give him, he's going to give them safe passage in to talk to Hrothgar. So definitely not to be confused with Xenia, they're questioned again. All right. At the bottom of page 23, then a proud warrior questioned the men concerning their origins. Where do you come from carrying these decorated shields and shirts of mail, these cheek-hinged helmets and javelins? I am Hrothgar's herald and officer. I have never seen so impressive or large an assembly of strangers. Stoutness of heart, bravery, not banishment must have brought you to Hrothgar. So you're coming here for out of bravery. You're not coming here because you've been banished and you have nowhere else to go. You're here on business. I can tell that. The man whose name was known for courage, the great leader, resolute in his helmet, answered him in return. We are retainers from Hylix Band. Beowulf is my name. If your lord and master, the most renowned son of Halfdane, will hear me out and graciously allow me to greet him in person, I am ready and willing to report my errand. All right. I'll let the king know, but I'll let the king know to his face. So on line 360, Wolfgar goes and talks to Hrothgar uh, and says, People from Geatland have put ashore. They have sailed far over the wide sea. They call the chief in charge of their band by the name of Beowulf. They beg my lord an audience with you, exchange of words and formal greeting. And then he goes on to say a few lines later, especially the one who has led them this far, he is formidable indeed. So we're seeing all of these people who are describing Beowulf as he's not a hanger-on in hero's armor. He's the real deal right here. He is formidable indeed. So we have this anticipation of Beowulf and Beowulf's power from everybody who has just simply laid eyes on him. They can tell by looking just how much of an impact this character is going to have in how this story continues. Hrothgar, it says, continuing on, protector of shieldings, replied, I used to know him when he was a young boy. His father before him was called Echtheo. So they know one another. Their families are connected. All right. So it's not as though he's really showing up. I mean, he's not known by the lesser people of Denmark here, the Danes here. He is known by the higher-ups, which gives him even more clout, even more um, impressive status among the other people. He says at the very bottom of that section there, they are welcome to Denmark. So as the introductions and, and this whole thing is, is continuing on, we see on page 29 something that's very important and something that is unique to these people into this work. And Beowulf is going to give his formal boast. All right. Now, this was something that people did at the time. It's not like, you know, weird flex, dude. That's not what we're talking about. What we got going on here is um, this is a way for him to say, look, you can trust me. It's his way of garnering ethos amongst the people is to say, I am fantastic. All right. Um, I'm going to begin... Oh, let's say about line 406 on page 29. It says, Greetings to Hrothgar. I am Hylix Kinsman, one of his hall troop. When I was younger, I had great triumphs. Then, news of Grendel, hard to ignore, reached me at home. Sailors brought stories of the plight you suffer in his legendary hall. How it, how it lies deserted, empty and useless, once the evening light hides itself under heaven's dome. So every elder, 
an experienced councilman among my people supported my resolve to come here to you, King Hrothgar, um, because all knew of my awesome strength. They had, they had seen me bolted in the blood of enemies when I battled and bound five beasts, raided a troll nest. There we go with the um, former um, Nordic uh, mythology. And in the night sea, slaughtered sea brutes. I've suffered extremes and avenged the Geats. Their enemies brought it upon themselves. I devastated them. Now I mean to be a match for Grendel. Settle the outcome in single combat. All right. Line 429. My one request is that you won't refuse me, who have come this far, the privilege of purifying Herod. He considers it a privilege to rid the hall of this demon Grendel. Skipping a line. I have heard, moreover, that the monster scorn in his, scorns in his reckless ways to use weapons. Therefore, to heighten Hylex's fame, I am and glad in his heart, I hereby renounce sword and the shelter of the broad shield, the heavy war uh, board, hand to hand is how it will be. Life and death, fight with the fiend. Whichever one death fells, it must, uh, must deem it a just judgment by God. So since the beast or the creature or the demon or whatever you want to call him does not fight with weapons, I won't fight with weapons either. We will fight hand to hand because it will bring me glory and it will bring my king, King Hylic, glory. All right. If I kill, if he doesn't fight with a sword, but I do, that gives me an advantage. And it's not as glorious to fight that way with the advantage. All right. Um, and he says, you know, and whoever wins is whoever wins, but whoever wins is who God the Christian God, in this case, deser uh, feels is just to win that. All right. He goes on. If Grendel wi wins, it will be a gruesome day. He will glut himself on the geats in the war hall, swoop without fear on that flower of manhood as on others before. Then my face won't be there to be covered in death. He will carry me away. As he goes ground, gorged and bloodied, he will run gloating with my raw corpse and feed on it alone in a cruel frenzy, fouling his moor nest. No need then to lament for long or lay out my body. If the battle takes me, send it back, send back this breast webbing that Wayland fashioned and Hrethel gave me to Lord Hylic. Fate goes ever as fate must. So we've got... We've got God, we've got fate, we've got uh, trolls and ogres and elves, and we've got the Almighty, and we've got Cain. We've got a, you know, mishmash of mythologies and religious beliefs and things just kind of working here. Um, it's a veritable cornucopia of belief systems, all right? So, <clears throat> this is interesting. On page 35. About line 499, this character Unferth comes in. And Unferth, very much the opposite of Xenia, kind of pushes back and says, Okay, Beowulf, are you that person that did this thing and you thought you were something? Line 499. From where he crouched at the king's feet, Unferth, a son of Eklaf, spoke contrary words. Beowulf's coming, his sea braving made him sick with envy. He could not brook or abide the fact that anyone else alive under heaven might enjoy greater regard than he did. So he's feeling like, you know, Beowulf's getting all this attention. And people look at Beowulf and go, oh man, you're something. And he came over by himself. And he's saying that he's going to fight Grendel. And he's going to fight him hand to hand. He must be brave or crazy or both. All right. But Unferth does not like the fact that Beowulf is getting all of this attention. So he's going to try to put Beowulf in his place. All right. He says, are you the Beowulf who took on Brekka in a swimming match on the open sea, risking the water just to prove that you could win? It was sheer vanity made you venture out on the main deep. All right. 
going about three lines uh, from the bottom there. It says, you vied for seven nights. So the swimming competition went on for seven nights. I don't nights. know about you, but a seven night swimming competition is extraordinary, you know, is, is definite proof of someone's extraordinary strength and vitality. It says, you vied for seven nights and then he outswam you, came ashore the stronger contender. He was cast up safe and sound one morning. Uh, skipping a few lines, Brecca made good his boast upon you and was proved right. So Beowulf lost this swimming competition. All right. He ends that saying, this time you'll be worsted. No one has ever outlasted an entire night against Grendel. So here's the deal. If you lost that swimming competition with Brecca, you don't stand a freaking chance against Grendel. There's just simply no way. Beowulf, Echtheo's son, replied, Well, friend Unferth, you have had your say about Brecca and me, but it was mostly beer that was doing the talking. The truth is this. When the going was heavy in those high waves, I was the strongest swimmer of all. We'd been children together, and we grew up daring ourselves to outdo each other, boasting and urging each other to risk our lives on the sea. So it goes on a few uh, lines, and he mentions that, you know, five nights they were at this, all right? And at the second line of page 39, it says, Some ocean creature pulled me to the bottom. Pinioned fast and swathed in its grip, I was granted one final chance. My sword plunged, and the ordeal was over. Through my own hands, the fury of battle had finished off the sea beast. So, not only was he in the swimming competition for days, yeah, Brecca won. But Brecca won because I was busy killing a sea beast. So, let's just be clear about who was the better in that, all right? He goes on. Time and again, foul things attacked me, lurking and stalking, but I lashed out. Gave as good as I got with my sword. My flesh was not for feasting on. There would be no monsters gnawing and gloating over their banquet at the bottom of the sea. Skipping about two or three lines. From now on, sailors would be safe. The deep sea raids were over for good. Light came from the east, bright guarantee of God. And the waves went quiet. I could see the headlines and buffeted cliffs. So I fought the sea beast. I fought other things. Brecca, he just swam, okay? So yeah, he got there first. I was a little tied up. All right. Um, and he says, even, you know, three lines down from that, my sword killed nine sea beasts. All right. He says on the last two lines of 39, now, I cannot recall any fight you entered on Firth that bears comparison. I don't boast when I say that neither you nor Brecca were ever much celebrated for swordsmanship nor for facing danger on the field of battle. You killed your own kith and kin. So, for all your cleverness and quick tongue, you will suffer damnation in the depths of hell. You killed your own people, he says. The fact is, Unferth, if you were truly as keen or courageous as you claim to be, Grendel would never have gotten away with such unchecked atrocity, attacks on your king, havoc inherent, and horrors everywhere. So don't come talk to me, Unferth. Don't try to do this, you know, pull this thing where, oh, Brecca beat me in a swimming competition. Yeah, he beat me in a swimming competition. I killed nine sea beasts. And you haven't done anything, but you actually ended up killing your own people before you joined the Danes. And if you were everything that you say you are, then why is Grendel still here, my man? It's as simple as that. Okay, that's where I'm going to leave you as we open up. All right, I want you to uh, continue reading on your own, annotating on your own, and I will be uh, back soon with my next installment. So until then, and as always, happy reading.